Aloha mamas and welcome to the mama mindset podcast episode number nine. I hope that these words land upon your soul in a way that is impactful, meaningful, and adds value to your life the same way that you are impactful, filled with so much meaning and add value to so many lives, not just the ones inside your home, but the ones at the boardroom, sitting around the boardroom at your workplaces sitting around your kitchen table in your home or any of those people that you happen to interact with. So this episode is going to continue what we were life chatting about before and sipping on, taking some deep sips uh, on claiming the trauma in our birth stories. And that kindness often is an invitation for us to validate all emotions, including sadness and anxiety and fear and some of the, you know, things we may, we may label more of a trauma that we exposed. We are gifted at minimizing our, I feel at minimizing our own traumas and at comparing our traumas and thinking, okay, well, I didn't have it that bad. So like, I better just be grateful and get over this. And it's not so much an invitation to kind of like wallow in it and become a victim of it. Not, not that, but more of a validating how we felt processing it, owning all of the emotions and what they're there to teach us so that we can move forward in a prosperous way, in a way that allows us to live in the freedom of knowing all of our emotions are there for us and we are safe to rise through them. And so I left off in my own birth story with my daughter, my, my becoming a mom story. And in my postpartum room, I think I had talked about how my daughter had gone to the newborn nursery with my husband to get her first bath. And I was there having this like, turkey and gravy concoction that came up from the cafeteria. I didn't get to my postpartum room until I think like just after midnight. So I was just stoked to eat whatever they had. <laughs> and I knew though, at that time that my body was experiencing some changes that weren't in alignment with health and how I should be feeling. And I mean, I, I didn't really know, you know, what the postpartum period would hold, but I, I did know medically as a physician and also being the expert on my own body, which we are the experts are in our own body. And that intuition is so powerful that all was not well. And, but I also did not want to accept that because here I was about to spend my first night slash morning slash hours as a new mom and awaiting, you know, my people to come back into the room, this little tiny postpartum room that we were crammed into watching construction outside. I remember, and I just wanted everything to be okay. You know, I had just persevered through this labor for me. My goal was to have an unmedicated vaginal delivery. And I was able to accomplish that. And I was so proud to claim that. And, and that I was able and blessed to reach down and pull my daughter out. And we were able to have skin to skin bonding. And I was more than willing to sacrifice my body for that. And all of us, um, as mothers, we do sacrifice our bodies in, in so many ways from the time we become pregnant and all that we go through in the hormonal harmony <laughs> and the growing of a, a new life in our body and all the changes that we endure all up until our delay, labor and delivery. And then the new body that we embrace and, and the new narrative of, of the strength that we move into postpartum and sacrificing our bodies every single day is jungle gyms and places to be hugged and all of the things that we show up with for the rest of our life in our, in our bodies. And here I was trying to remedy this growing conviction that there was something amiss in my body and this overwhelming desire to jump into new motherhood and being in a family together in our first night and all that was to come. And so when they came back, I remember, um, it was, it was pretty late. So I think I breastfed my daughter and just marveled at her and her little I call them spam masubis. The nurses are absolute magicians at swaddling. I, I still have not perfected this skill as a physician and apologize to all those nurses in the newborn nursery where I would come and examine the babies so many times. And then I would do my best to swaddle it back, but it was never, never quite to the degree of precision and just 
amazing swaddling that they can do. And so in Hawaii, we have these spam masubis, which are these rice, uh, they could be stuffed with various things. Spam is really popular here. So it's a lot of times it's spam. And then there, there's like a piece of seaweed around it and um, rice. But anyway, it reminds me of the way it's like tightly packed and very, there's a lot of attention to detail and, and, and intention around it. Uh, similar to the presentation of Japanese food and sushi, which is such a visual delight, the way, the way that it's done so intentionally and with so much care and skill the way that these swaddles were arranged on these newborns, incredible. So here comes my daughter and her little spam masubi swaddle. And I remember my husband falling asleep that night. He's exhausted. He's been up um, coaching and just being front row, part of the delivery, labor and delivery experience and giving, giving all of his energy and so excited to be a new dad and, and uh, to have his baby daughter. And, and I remember looking over at both of them my daughter was in the bassinet. We had clear bassinets in our hospital next to me in my hospital bed. And I'm, I'm next to the window. And then, so I'm there and then she's in her clear bassinet. And then, uh, my husband is in his reclining bedside chair sleeping and they both were so peaceful and beautiful. And I remember so much contentment, so much peace and so much joy and gratitude in that moment of looking over at them. And also feeling so much inner turmoil, fear, anxiety, and dread about what was happening in my body. And I think that's something that we're very capable of as women is kind of hold, holding so many emotions where we can, we do that. We have like empathy and nourishment for other people. And then how do we remedy that with what might be going on with us pushing out my glasses a lot. Um, and I think that's a powerful, we're a powerful vessel in that way. And the more we tap into what that intuition is going on inside of us and validate, recognize, nurture those emotions and allow them to come forth. And so that they don't hold power over us, but they're there to teach us that's that path to our healing and to stepping more and more into our mom momentum, that forward momentum that's meant to prosper us. And so I started tapping more into that knowledge. I was doing orthostatic vitals on myself, which in the hospital setting, that's um, just taking inventory of your heart rate and your blood pressure and how that's changing between when you're lying down and sitting up or standing. And, you know, I had been monitoring my fluid intake and I had an amazing nurse who was checking on me as well, who actually knew from the, uh, we had worked together in the NICU downstairs. And again, my OB team was absolutely phenomenal as well. And this was just something that was occurring with my body, something that happened postpartum. Our bodies are extremely complex and, you know, truly God bless the OBGYNs who dedicate and the nurses in the, in the labor and delivery units and in the postpartum unit who dedicate their careers and lives and passion and genius zones and brilliance and empathy to mothers who are bringing forth these miracles into the world, into the complexity of our bodies and how they change and how, how they serve us and how they help us nurture ourselves. As we go through this chapter, it's, ex it's an extremely selfless role. A lot of times that they play and the hours that they work coming in on call, because babies, as we know, are born whenever they start writing their story, whenever that is their destiny to write it. And they are there and they are, they wear many hats. They are our counselors in the office and they are extremely gifted at listening to women's stories. They are great primary care physicians in the sense of uh, helping women with their preventative care and different things that we go through with pap smears and as we age and uh, the different hormones cascades that occur in our bone density and mammograms and helping counsel us on how to empower ourselves around our bodies and giving us options around birth control and just being advocates for women in every facet they have is, uh, there's a beautiful book called the vagina Bible, uh, by a OBGYN doctor who's amazing. And she always talks about having a vagenda. Like she wants her agenda. Vagenda is, is to empower women around their bodies and how amazing they are and how we need to claim all of that. And so I applaud OBs for all the work that they do in there. And in addition to what they do in the office, they are gifted surgeons. They are skilled with their hands. They know how to come into a 
vaginal delivery room and help usher that baby into the world. They know how to respond when things aren't going well. They know how to help the woman tap into her inner power. And they, they are great coaches in that way. And they oftentimes they'll provide biofeedback with mirrors or different things or different cues. And they also know how to respond when something might be amiss in there. And that, that is an amazing skill. And they also are gifted surgeons in the OR and they can get a baby out. And I have seen it. I have been at the table many, many times, hundreds of times and marveled at their work. They are tender, but they are, are quick and fast and committed to the health of that mother and that baby and making decisions in a split moment, working with anesthesiologists and the pediatricians and the neonatologists in the room. And I always was so honored to be a part of that transfer process of them extracting a baby from a mom, maybe in a crisis scenario and in an emergency section, and then receiving that baby from the OB and the collaboration we had there at the, at the surgical table in the OR. And they, and, and, and they, they are trauma surgeons in a lot of ways. They're called down to the emergency room for different things. A woman could be coming in in labor or a woman could be having an ectopic pregnancy or, and, or different other life-threatening conditions. And so truly they deserve our utmost respect and for answering and heeding that calling of learning about the intricacies in medical school and all of their grueling training of the female body, and then choosing throughout their career and the livelihood of their lives to miss certain events at their dinner table and their children's sporting events, because they are so passionate about supporting moms and their health and uh, a mom's choice to, uh, or women's choice to become a mom. I should say they're passionate about women, but then also women who choose to become moms, women who don't choose to become moms, all, all of it, women who become moms by any Avenue. There are, there are subsets of the OB specialty now, like growing amounts of reproductive endocrinologists who have dedicated their careers to helping women achieve motherhood by many paths through infertility or surrogacy. And it, those are all of them. I love, I love the fact that I've been able to have a front row seat to that profession, working in pediatrics and coming up through medical school. I loved OB. I, I truly did think about it, but I also knew that when the baby was born, I kind of facilitated and gravitated toward following the baby and like wondering how they went. So I knew, and from a medical sense that my, my destiny was to land upon in pediatrics, but I never forgot my affinity for that role and working with the mom and my admiration of the OBs. And I have many OB friends in real life and those I have yet to meet. So this is a huge gratitude coming from that. And from all, for all of us to just think about and take a moment of just to reflect upon how amazing these men and women that choose to be obese in our society truly are. And the genius zones of the nurses and nurse techs that labor and delivery nurses and the postpartum nurses are some of the most gifted, smartest, brilliant, most brilliant people you will ever meet and their ability to care for mom and baby and the, the knowledge that they have, the empathy and the way that they can pick up on the social dynamics and the read between the lines of things. They, they interpret so much for the, uh, for the medical team, the, the OBs and the pediatricians that are coming in when we collaborate with the nurses and the knowledge that they're able to impart to us because of what they can read in the situation with the mom and the constellation of the new family unit, how the baby's doing it's, it is truly the, the secret sauce that makes it all work. And their presence at the bedside through, through the, the duration of your labor and delivery. And then in your postpartum period, they're, they're there, right. They're the front lines, they're reporting back and they have that, that feedback They're They're the coaches in many ways of a lot of it. Um, and also lactation consultants, I'm just pulling in all the people I love because I love working with them. And then when I got to be a mom in the hospital, it was incredible learning from the lactation consultants and their wealth of knowledge about how we get, if you choose to breastfeed, you get to enter into this amazing magical realm of understanding your body and that you get to provide your child nourishment. It's absolutely incredible. And I'm looking forward to doing breastfeeding medicine, um, life chats in the future about my own experience and my fascination with breastfeeding and also normalizing bottle feeding and other choices that mothers either have to make or choose to make. And so lactation consultants are amazing and totally see them if they're in your hospital and you have the ability to do that. I, I loved mine working with mine and also 
getting to benefit from their knowledge as a new mom. And I also had them come when I had my son the second time around. They're great at involving fathers and partners um, and kind of making breastfeeding a team sport, if you will, and just helping instill the importance of that if that's the path that you're choosing. So there are just so many people involved and it's also important to kind of come back to your own intuition, your own power that you're stepping into. So here I was in the postpartum room and I was taking my own vital signs and the, my nurse who I, I was also friends with, was, we were becoming more and more concerned about my hemodynamic status, right? We knew that there was some blood loss in the delivery room that my OB had appropriately medically managed and addressed with suturing and packing. And there had been uh, blood labs taken before I had been moved upstairs, of course, to make sure that I was stable and ready for transport. So all, all the appropriate steps had been, had been done. Just this ongoing blood loss and just the feelings of how, how I knew my body was responding. Oftentimes our bodies are extremely resilient and I, I love medicine for, for so many reasons. And I love the bodies that we've been given because they are so magnificent. They are unbelievably complex and their natural trajectory is for health and for balance and for homeostasis and the way that the body tries to accomplish that even through the grueling trauma that is birth it is trauma it is trauma for the mom it is trauma for the baby let's own that and let's claim that and that's biologically divinely designed we were created to have trauma to bring forth the baby and the baby was created to endure and react to that trauma in such a way that it changes their cardiorespiratory circulation in their body, that that stress of coming down a narrow, not comfortable, getting squeezed out of the vaginal canal is stressful. And that's why they come out crying and we need them to come out crying because they are inducted into the world. And they, with those first gulps of air, they are changing the way that they were in fetal, fetal life in utero. And now in the real world and babies that don't get stressed enough oftentimes, or maybe, maybe a C-section had to happen for a reason. They oftentimes needs, they oftentimes need us as a pediatricians or the neonatologists that are attending de deliveries to help stimulate them and give them the memo that, Hey, like, welcome to the world. Let's get a little bit stressed. Let's, let's get that heart rate going and that breathing going. And so that's oftentimes our role is just to help them along their natural path and their natural inclination that maybe they were they weren't quite ready yet. Um, from a belly birth standpoint, some of them come out crying. It's all, it's all different, but the point is that I want to claim that birth is a trauma. It's yes, it's beautiful. And oftentimes experiences in life that are beautiful have come with hard elements, right? Like we didn't, we have to, we have to earn things that we, we, a lot of times in life that we feel, um, that sense of accomplishment, that sense of pride in our bodies, whether it's running a race or in this case, giving birth. And so I was coming to claim that trauma of, okay, this was an eight and a half hour for me, eight and a half hour, um, from start to finish labor and delivery of an eight pound, 10 ounce baby girl. And I have extensive tearing and you could have no tearing. It's still, it's still a trauma the way that you, you, you endure labor and delivery. And so my nurse was collaborating with the medical team and we were kind of, and kind of giving reports on some of the vital, concerning vital signs that were happening for me that were all evidence of continued blood loss. And kind of what I was telling you about before our body's natural inclination is to calibrate, to come into harmony and to re reestablish homeostasis and balance. And so the body will try many ways, oftentimes through vital signs, when you have an acute blood loss, like I did through, through delivery. So it tries to bring up your heart rate and your blood pressure is lower. And it's just trying to maintain those natural functions. You know, it needs, your heart needs blood to distribute to your body. And when you have less of it, less blood volume, there are different adaptations that your body will naturally take in order to preserve all of the vital things that need to happen, all of the organs that need to be perfused, all the blood that your brain needs to receive. And, uh, in severe anemia, you'll start noticing things that tell you to slow down, like shortness of breath. And you have chest pain when you try to get up and walk. And when anemia happens over a long period of time, it's a chronic course. Your body can adjust to those, to that slower pace of blood loss. But when it happens very quickly and you go from like a normal blood level, blood hemoglobin 
um, levels to an acute loss, you're more susceptible to those symptoms because it happened so quickly. And in my case, that's how it, it was. And, um, and so we started getting more information about, you know, from more follow-up on the blood work about the acute blood loss and that it was just kind of continuing to decrease, which went along with all of the physiological signs my body was demonstrating in my vital signs and in the, in the blood work, the hemoglobin, hematocrit and other things we were getting. And so by the next day, um, I was able to, and I'm, I'm, I'm so proud of myself for all of this, be in those moments with my daughter, Camden Micaiah and my husband, JD. And we also brought a, uh, Bose like portable speaker, which I highly recommend to all expectant moms, or if you're going to have another baby, it's just so nice to have that ambiance and just play your own music and music is so healing in so many ways. Plus the hospital staff, we all love it. Um, so we're there and I was able to be in all those moments and also tend to myself and advocate for myself and collaborate with my medical team. And that's part of it is knowing your body, articulating what you're feeling and advocating for yourself. And that's very important. And we really respect that from a medical side. And I knew that that was something I needed to do as a patient in this perspective and in this example. And so the next day I started getting blood transfusions, um, which are, it is so humbling to be on the other side of these. I had ordered many blood transfusions for my patients for various reasons. Um, and here I was on the receiving end of getting blood transfusions, which we never, we never take those lightly. We're very grateful for donors and there are various risks involved. And we've also gotten it down to a very wonderful science. And so you know, not the postpartum chapter that I would have written to be written. And I ended up receiving over the subsequent days, like four separate, you know, blood transfusions, which is a lot of blood to be receiving and a lot for my body to be enduring. And I was a new mom and breastfeeding and trying to be in the postpartum pictures that I was so excited about. And I look back on those pictures of joy and I'm so grateful. And I can see the IV with the blood going in and I can see how pale I was and there's like no color in my lips and just the triumph that I was claiming in that space of being a new mom and also processing the trauma in my body. And over the subsequent days, uh, coming to know my, my, the newness of everything down there with all of the tearing. And I remember that. So part of our postpartum bodies, like I'm going to go there with the, the, um, the postpartum stooling because I think it's an important topic that we all need to be more aware of. OBs are on it. They try to give colase and different kinds of medicines that help soften your stool because part of the hormonal cascade that happens in the way that you're transitioning in a postpartum period already predisposes you to some constipation. And also with the changes in the female anatomy and, and from the trauma of birth, whether you had stitches or not, there, there can be some reluctance to maybe, uh, stool and poop because it's a little bit painful. So for me, I had stitches for my third degree tearing that were extending through the perineum, the space between the vaginal and the anal canal that was coming, you know, all along that space. And, uh, from getting a blood transfusion, a lot of, of that can be a constipating factor. So I had some several combining factors that were contributing for me. And so I believe it was like six days postpartum. You guys, I was like, and ladies, I might, maybe you guys watch this, but mostly females. So I don't like when I say you guys, so I'm claiming I'm pivoting from that, but I remember sitting on the toilet in our little yellow bungalow in Honolulu. We had the cutest little plantation house and doing like positive visualization with myself about how this poop was going to go down and just trying all the things and just picturing what my chest x-ray, the physician in me couldn't help, but like think about what my chest x-ray would look like. Cause I often had to get, um, chest and abdominal films on children who came in with belly pain and it was due to constipation. And you would just see so much poop, like a massive, impressive amounts of poop in their intestines. And I was like, this is probably me. Like I'm probably literally up to my diaphragm and knew that this was something my body needed to evacuate, but it was also terrified because I was in a lot of pain with all of my, uh, postpartum sutures and, and, and all of that. And I obviously have a pretty high pain tolerance and, but it was, it was extremely uncomfortable. 
just getting in and out of bed and moving around and still recovering from my blood loss and being anemic, even upon discharge. So I'm dealing with all of these things and doing all the, the, the night feeds. And I remember eating all the great lasagna and foods that people brought over. So thank you all so much for that. And also bachelor in paradise was happening for me at night and my husband was getting up and our Husky was getting up with me and it was a whole team thing. And I remember the day that it happened the day of the first postpartum. And it was so traumatizing. It was like the second delivery. Okay. So I'm going to talk about that because I, if I can prevent like this kind of pain and trauma for another mom, I will, because I do not desire this for anyone else. And I think we can all find a lot of commonality in this topic. And so what some of our dear friends had come over and they brought Camden, her first flower bouquet, and it was beautiful. And I, these people, I love them. They're like chosen Ohana. That's really a concept that's resonated in my soul since living in Hawaii. We have family that we're born into that we're so blessed that are, that shape our character and that are integral, divinely chosen people in our lives. And then we have chosen Ohana, those people that we meet through the seasons of our lives and, and how powerful that is. And I think when you become parents and for us as mamas, we're so grateful for the people we are excited to shape our children's world and those chosen people that we're bringing in as family. And so this, uh, this couple is, it, are people that have just loved us so well since we moved to Hawaii and they were there and had knocked at the door. And I just remember like the urge came on. Cause I mean, I had sat on the potty toilet so many times the throne, like I was like, here I am queen with my crown on this throne. I got this, like, I know how to rule on this, but yeah, like it still hadn't happened. And so I remember the urge coming and I was like trying to see them out the door in some kind of way, graceful way. I'm sure it wasn't graceful, but I know them well enough. And like, they're, they're cool. And I remember talking to JD and I remember sobbing because it came with such force. This, this like poop explosion it was like a poop apocalypse. I remember sitting down and I couldn't control it. So the explosion that happened, there was, I, I ripped many sutures and like the entire bowl was like filled with blood and it was so painful. It was excruciating. And I remember JD like rubbing my back and I was just trying to breathe through it and just like allow myself to sob and cry. Cause it was so traumatic and so painful, but also like, thank God that it was expelled. And I had this first stool and hoping that the subsequent ones would be better. And so that's part of the second, I think the second delivery is that like initial stool. And so treating our bodies with reverence and all the normal functions that have to happen with all of the cascade of hormones and what, what we have endured with the trauma of birth and having reverence for that and knowing that we can, we, we will get through all of this, that it's not pretty. Um, but it gets to be, we, it gets to be beautiful. It gets to be hilarious. It gets to be something that we unpack and that we claim. And so I do totally advocate for just keeping your good hydration, Miralax and Colace and different can speak with your OBs about this, but managing and having some kind of bowel regimen, I think is very powerful it, even before you're giving birth and just managing that so that that first experience of delivering your food's first poop is, uh, as painless and regular on your throne as, as it can be queen. So that is a lot of my postpartum experience. And, um, so the four transfusions that I received definitely helped me so much. And I, as I was saying, I left the hospital still anemic and I still had for several weeks, shortness of breath, getting up and going to the bathroom and doing anything. Um, but I was just so thankful to be in those moments. And for me, I was in residency and I chose to spend 12 weeks with my daughter, which was kind of unprecedented. I just chose to graduate late from residency because I knew that sacred time was everything to me. I mean, all the moments of their lives are sacred, but just giving myself the, the space, the permission to come into that, that was the beginning for me really of a huge pivot of giving myself permission. And mama mindset is a lot about that. Giving ourselves permission. There is no one else, no one else that can put the crown on your head, but you that can give yourself permission to come to all of the gloriousness, all of the magnetic 
brilliance that you are capable of, that you were divinely designed to embrace and embody and emanate in your life. And you can enjoy your pregnancy. There are lots of uncomfortable moments that we go through. And some people love being pregnant. Some people don't claim it. However, is of most value and service to you, but it is incredible what your body is capable of. And if you have endured infertility or chosen another route to motherhood, that strength that you cultivated, that the way you persevered through those seasons, that is so beautiful, so profound, so it's hard to put into words for me because I, I met all of those mothers. I've met mothers of every single circumstance and color, and I'm still meeting more and more moms. And I love, I love that. I, I am so honored of that privilege of getting to care for your babies and of now turning my stethoscope back onto the mama and her mindset and how important it is for her to come into alignment. And so for me, I know those moments, those raw, vulnerable, authentic moments that I'm sharing with you, my own experience of becoming a mama. And I'll talk in a future episodes about my birth story with my son, Cruz. But for me, unpacking and owning the trauma that occurred in my delivery was so healing, so much a part of my healing. And for a long time, I just kind of minimized it because I was like, well, I didn't have a code red, which code red is when you're losing so much blood in the delivery room that you're just basically, we call a code on, on those patients because they need immediate intervention. So me being the physician and going to like these extreme circumstances. Here I am minimizing this like profound blood loss that I, that occurred for me in the four units of blood, which is a lot of blood and minimizing my own. So kind of coming back to illustrating that point that I think we're very gifted at minimizing our traumas and that doesn't serve us. It doesn't serve any of us or anyone around us. So owning what we've been through and allowing the space to heal and maybe of being that observer, maybe taking that they call it 20,000 foot view or whatever altitude you're comfortable at. Just looking down and having compassion and empathy, radical compassion for her, what she went through, being proud of her, laughing at the moments that were funny and have humor and, and, and giving her a hug or giving, sending her energy and love and intention and kindness at all of the emotions, all of the things that she felt as she went through the trials and tribulations of all of those contractions and the transitional points in her, your labor and your delivery of that divine new being and that in your, the delivery of yourself and the permission that you gave yourself to transition into this new role. Maybe you're just doing that now, but what you've done is, is magnificent. It is so magnificent. And you as this transformed human being in your role as a mother, in addition to everything you are as a woman, as a visionary, as a creative, as an artist, as someone who's embracing her mindset as her sharpest, most brilliant tool and who are choosing to use it in a way that uplifts other women is the most wonderful investment you can ever make. And so I'm so grateful that you're here listening to my story in the postpartum period and all of its glory, even on my porcelain throne at home and how that wasn't super glorious. Um, but I, I will not water this down because that is that I, I feel so can so much conviction and so much passion and so much peace in the vulnerability of coming here unscripted, unedited, sitting down and believing and having faith that there is this artist in me. And she, she was destined to, to create this space and to meet with you and to benefit from all of the brilliance that you bring, because it is this global initiative of mama mindset that we're all, we're all together across the deliveries that are happening right now, the moms that are going into labor right now, the moms that are being wheeled into a C-section, those moms are who are, you know, how to give birth at home or on the way to the hospital or whatever environment you chose. And I do hold space for all moms and all decisions that they make around their bodies. And it's, it's so sacred to me. And so I felt, I felt convicted to offer in, in vulnerability, my own story, and also the invitation that being kind to ourselves often involves a willingness to get uncomfortable and unpack all of the emotions, just like it's uncomfortable to go through labor and it elicits every 
ounce of strength and emotion that we're capable of producing. But it's so beautiful, the symphony and harmony of it all. And your story of different traumas that have occurred in your life, and definitely your birth story, which is a trauma in and of itself. Can you practice radical compassion and kindness for yourself by allowing the sadness and, and, and all of the emotions that were in it to come forth and, and deliver all of those so that you can experience the profound peace that is also divinely woven into your DNA and that you're and, and, and that you crave to be in alignment with. I think we all want to have some clarity and, and peace around our birth stories. And so allowing yourself to grieve the parts that didn't go the way that you had envisioned or that you wish were different is super powerful and super impactful. And I really want that for you. I really desire that for you. I have so many mama friends and, and, you know, there are things that you know, obviously would have been great if I didn't go through acute blood loss, uh, but it happened, you know, and it would have been great if I didn't have to like labor again on my porcelain throne at home and have this like super painful poop, but it happened. And I, you know, and going back and owning all of those and claiming all of those for me has been so transformative and transcending, and I know it can be for you. And so I encourage you to just unpack and un revisit in a meditative and loving way, your birth story, whether you're, maybe you want to write it out. Maybe you want to talk it out. Maybe you just want to lay down and, and, and envision it again and, and go through it and nurture yourself through those pivotal moments and those emotions and the painful parts, physically painful, but also maybe the emotionally and spiritually painful parts where maybe you had to be away from baby and you didn't want to, or you had to have a C-section and that you really desired a vaginal birth or your baby had to be um, given some medical attention and you didn't have the skin to skin initially that you had really desired. Many, many, many things happen for mamas and those all play into the way that we view ourselves and, and there may be parts of our birth stories that we blocked out because they were painful for us. What if it was all there to serve you? And what if you were safe to go back through all of it and to, um, to, to really claim it all? It's your story. It's beautifully written and it is for you and everything is happening for your highest good. And you are amazing and magnificent. And you're here, you're here investing in yourself and listening to this. And my story was meant to be a portal into your story because we all, the diversity of our birth stories is profound, but it's also th this common fertile ground that we're in where we, we see each other. I see you, I validate you, and I'll never get tired of hearing people's birth stories. I will, I love it. If you want to share your birth story, you can email me at alohotmamamindset.com. I, for me, it's fascinating to hear and to be invited into that sacred and vulnerable space. And so here where I know my currency is vulnerability and moving forward with you all and then sharing and coming and sitting down the physician side of me is, you know, understandably about preparation and poise and bringing my best every day to you and your, your miracles. And the artist side of me has always known how to connect and had that sixth sense, that supernatural, um, superpower of just understanding a mama's intuition and now having that myself and sharing that with you. This is, this is her, like that I'm manifesting and allowing to come out and, and sit here. So I'm, I'll be forever grateful for the space that you are providing me to come into my genius zone in this way. And for us to get to experience each other's birth traumas and whatever other traumas you've endured in life, um, that pay homage to your power as a woman and as a mama and to all that you are, we are not, you are not one thing. You are many, many things. And that's something for another life chat, but just knowing and claiming. And I, I am finally in that place where I am not one thing. I am a board certified pediatrician, a sports medicine physician, a writer, a, a sometimes yogi cat and cowing and moo, mooing and meowing and mama stay. My daughter loves to say, and I love that so much. That's also for another day. And I am a entrepreneur. And I am a, a business owner in mama mindset, but what I truly envision it as is just this growing global initiative of mamas. I love to, I love traveling, whether it's to Costco down the street or beyond the reef of where we live. I love surfing. There's not a time where I don't think about the, um, 
the gray figures swimming around in our islands and the fact that it's not our home, but I love to get out there and do things that challenge me in nature and connect me in nature. I love huskies and I'm a husky dog mom and he's my first baby and he always will be. And I love children's books and writing and I'm hoping to write and release children's books into the wild this year. And it's something that's been a passion of mine for as long as I can remember. And I love connecting and having soulful life chats in that I love that I've leaned into this and, and created this mama mindset out of my passions. And when I finally sat down and surrendered and submitted to all of this, you know, the tension that I had in me and the limiting beliefs that was like, you must do this as a physician before you can create this space. And I finally said, no, I'm being called and I am in divine vertical alignment with the fact that I know that as a mama and all the mamas that I've been privileged to serve and that I value in my own personal and professional life that we can benefit from this space and this mindset shift and these pivots and this unconditional supportive environment to validate all of our emotions and all of our traumas and wade through all of it together. So I could keep sipping life lattes and all of this all night, mama, but that magical intuition, that mama tuition resides in you. It invites you. It offers you peace from the overwhelm that you feel during motherhood, the season of motherhood. And it invites to you in this specific example and instance that we're talking about today to experience peace through your birth story, to experience overwhelming peace and gratitude, even amidst the trauma and grief that you may have for the way that events transpired and um, in your labor and delivery process. And so I, I want that for you and desire that for you and know that that's possible for you. And I think practicing radical, I, I know, and I feel very strongly that practicing radical compassion and kindness for yourself is that willingness to travel, to earn that passport into the far corners of your soul where you've tucked away different memories and pieces for protection, but knowing that you're safe to travel there and experience those and to coach yourself through, coach yourself through those and to ask for what those emotions have for you, what those repressed memories have to offer you. And you are beautiful. You are talented. You are inspiring and I can't wait to see, see what you do next. So I hope you have a beautiful day, night, excuse me, whatever is happening ahead of you. And I hope you know that you are so treasured, so loved. And I will see you next time. Aloha, mama.